Hello my lovely kittens, in this video we're going to be covering everything you need for your first Edexcel chemistry exam. Now if you want to follow along as we're going through, you can get the free revision guide over on my website where I've taken the specification, turned it all into nice for you, taken all the different bits that you need to learn, the formulas of compounds and ions, the reactivity series, and I've put that all in there for you, all available to download for free for you. The model of the atom has changed quite a lot over time. You don't need to know all the details of this, you need to know that Rutherford was responsible for discovering the nucleus and protons. That Chadwick discovered neutrons. and that Bohr is our current, or developed our current model. Here we have the structure of an atom. We have electrons that are on the shells around the outside, protons that are in the middle, and neutrons that are in the middle. And this bit in the middle here is collectively called the nucleus. Protons are in the nucleus, they have a mass of 1 and a charge of plus 1. Neutrons are also in the nucleus, they have a mass of 1 and a charge of 0. Electrons are in the outer shells, their mass is 1 to thousandths and they have a charge of minus 1. On the periodic table you will see lots of boxes like this. This tells you all about the elements. This is the element's name, the symbol, and there are two numbers. This is the atomic number, and this one is the mass number. Now for these, location doesn't matter. Different textbooks, different sheets are going to put them in different locations. The larger one is the mass number. And the smaller one is the atomic number. The atomic number tells us the number of protons. And the number of electrons in an atom. The mass number is the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. So here we have calcium. The smaller number is the atomic number. The large number is the mass number. And if you want to find the number of protons, it is simply the atomic number, so in this case, 20. The number of electrons is also the atomic number, so again, 20. The neutrons is the mass number, which is 40, minus the atomic number, which is 20, equaling 20. Here we have two different isotopes of carbon. Carbon 12 and carbon 14. Working out the number of protons is exactly the same. It's the atomic number, so for both of those, that is 6. The number of electrons in an atom is the same as the number of protons, so that is 6. But the neutrons here is different, because for carbon-12, it is 12 minus 6, giving us 6 neutrons. And for carbon-14, it is 14 minus 6, giving us 8 neutrons. So an isotope is something that has the same number of protons, but a different number of neutrons. And a proton is what identifies the identity of an atom. You may have noticed from the periodic table that some things have 0.5 mass. So chlorine has 35.5 mass. Which is frankly ridiculous because we can't have half protons or half neutrons. This is because the mass is the relative abundance of all of the isotopes. There are two main isotopes of chlorine, chlorine-35 and chlorine-37. 75% of naturally occurring isotopes are chlorine-35. And 25% of the naturally occurring isotopes are chlorine-37. To work out the mass, this is what we do. You take that MR, 37, times it by the relative abundance. 
25%. Do this for all of them. 35 times 75. And then divide that by 100. 37 times 25 is 925. Plus 35 times 75, that's 2,625. Over 100, giving us 3,550 over 100, making it 35.5. Here we have our wonderful, beautiful periodic table. It is a list of all the elements which are known to exist. Elements are a single type of atom. An atom is a very, very small thing. The word atom is actually Greek for uncuttable. And when they named them, they thought it was the smallest thing possible. The periodic table tells us loads and loads and loads of information about the elements, the range of elements that are known to exist. There are still loads yet to be discovered. A compound is two or more elements that are chemically bonded together. That's the important thing. Chemically bonded together. Our periodic table hasn't always looked like this. The first attempt at a periodic table was by Newlands in the 1800s. He tried to group things into octaves and break them by pattern, which is a really good idea, except we have oxygen and iron in the same group, and they have very different properties. He grouped them, he arranged them by mass, but he didn't leave any gaps. And he tried to force things in to have similar patterns or properties as other things, and it didn't really work. Mendeleev was the next person to have a go. He also arranged things by mass, but the key thing is that he left gaps in his periodic table. And because he arranged things um, so that they were in groups with similar patterns, and he left gaps, he could predict the properties of elements that have yet to be discovered, and he was correct in his predictions. A few years after he developed his periodic table, a couple of new elements were discovered, and they fitted in really, really neatly, really nicely to his periodic table. So this table was accepted. It has changed ever so slightly by them. We now arrange things by electronic arrangement, but that's a very, very subtle difference. The periodic table gives us loads and loads of information. The first bit of information it gives us are about groups. Now, groups go down the periodic table. Group 1, group 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, or group 0. Groups tell us the number of electrons on the outer shell. So things in group 1 are going to have one electron in the outer shell. Things in group 2 are going to have two electrons in the outer shell. Group 6, six electrons in the outer shell. Group 7, seven electrons in the outer shell. Periods go across the periodic table. So here is our first period, the one that everyone always forgets because it's only got hydrogen and helium in. Here is our second period. Here is our third period. And the periods relate to the number of shells that things have. They also remind us how many electrons there are on the, in each shell. So in the first period, there are two elements, which means there are going to be two electrons in that shell. In the second period, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight elements, which means there are going to be eight electrons in that shell. And we can use this information to tell us about the electronic configuration. Here we have magnesium. Here is magnesium on the periodic table, and we can see that the number of electrons it has is 12. It is in group 2, and it is in period 3. So that tells us it has 12 electrons in total. It has 2 electrons on the outer shell, because it's in group number 2. And it has 3 shells, because it is in period number 3. So when we want to draw the electronic configuration of magnesium, we know it's in period 3, it's going to have 3 shells. The first thing we can do is draw 3 shells. 2, 1, 2 go on the first um, shell. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 go on the second shell. That's the most that can fit in that shell. That brings us up to 10. 10, 11, 12 two electrons on the outer shell. From the periods, we know that the first shell can hold a maximum of two electrons, the second shell can hold a maximum of eight electrons. 
The third shell can hold a maximum of eight electrons, and then you only need to know up to calcium, so another two for your GCSE. Metals are going to lose electrons, and when we lose electrons, we get positive charges. And non-metals are going to be gaining electrons, and when we gain electrons, we get negative charges. Things in group one are going to lose one electron, so are going to be plus one ions. Things in group two are going to lose two electrons, so are going to be plus two ions. Things in group six here are going to gain two electrons, so are going to be minus two ions. And things in group seven are going to gain one electron, so are going to be minus one ions. Ionic bonding is the transfer of electrons from a metal, which is on this side of the periodic table, to a non-metal on this side of the periodic table. Anything that is in group 1 is going to form a plus 1 ion, group 2 a plus 2 ion, group 6 a minus 2 ion, group 7 a minus 1 ion. Here we are going to make magnesium oxide. Magnesium is in group 2, so it has 2 electrons on its outer shell. Oxygen is in group 6, so it has 6 electrons on its outer shell. In ionic bonding, oxygen is going to keep the electrons that it's already had, and the electrons that were with magnesium are going to be transferred to oxygen. We call these dot and cross diagrams because one element has a dot for electrons and the other element has a cross for electrons. We then draw square brackets around these and indicate the charge. So magnesium has lost two electrons, so it's going to have a plus two charge. Oxygen has gained two electrons, so it's going to have a minus two charge. Here we have sodium, and it has an atomic number of 11, which means it's gonna have 11 protons in the nucleus, and new protons have a positive charge. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. Now, in the atom, it has 11 electrons drawn on here. Electrons have a negative charge. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Now, in an atom, the positive charges and the negative charges cancel each other out. So the overall charge on the atom is going to be 0. However, when sodium makes an iron, this electron here goes away. So it still has the same number of protons, it's still sodium. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. But it's lost an electron. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So it has one more proton than it has an electron, meaning this is going to have an overall positive charge. Here we have sodium chloride. Sodium are the grey bits you can see and chlorine are the green bits you can see. The blue lines are the electrostatic interactions, the electrostatic attractions. Because the way we get you to draw ionic bonding is really false. It's not just one sodium combining with one chlorine. It is this massive, massive, massive lattice of sodiums and chlorines, or whatever we're looking at, bonding with everything else. So one sodium here isn't just going to be bonded with the chlorine um, next to it or the chlorine that it's exchanged electrons to. It's going to be bonded with all of the other ones above it, next to it, behind it, in front of it, everything that it can reach. So this ionic bonding is a massive, massive, massive network, not just the small things that we get you to draw in class. So for ionic compounds, the structure is a giant ionic lattice. Properties, it is going to have a high melting point, high boiling point, and it is only going to conduct when molten or dissolved. This is because the ions need to be free to move.
Covalent bonding is the sharing of electrons between two non-metals, these up here. And these are the common ones you need to know how to draw. For each of these, you need to be able to give the name, the formula, be able to draw it with lines, and be able to draw the dot and cross diagram. So hydrochloric acid or hydrogen chloride, one element of hydrogen, one element of chlorine. Ammonia, NH3, nitrogen in the middle, three hydrogens coming off around the side. Methane, CH4, carbon in the middle, four hydrogens branching off it. Hydrogen, H2, very simple one there. Chlorine, halogens go around as diatomic molecules. Oxygen, we're getting a bit tricky now, has a double bond. Each line is equal to a pair of electrons. Here we have two lines, that is two pairs of electrons. We need four electrons being shared in the middle. And nitrogen has a triple bond. Two, four, six electrons being shared in the middle. If in the exam they give you a picture and ask you to link the formula of it, you simply need to list what we have. So in the first one we have carbon and we have hydrogen and then we need to count them. One, two, three, four, five. Carbon, five. Hydrogens, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Last one, carbon, hydrogen, Oxygen, we have one, two, three carbons. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight hydrogens and one oxygen, so we don't need to put a number after that. It's really important that you write things in the right um, size and in the right place. So that is incorrect because your numbers are too big. That is incorrect because your numbers are in the wrong place. I seriously recommend you learn at least these formula. Carbon dioxide is CO2, water, H2O, oxygen gas, O2, hydrogen gas, H2, nitrogen gas, N2, ammonia, NH3, hydrochloric acid, HCl, sulfuric acid is H2SO4. For simple covalent compounds, such as water, carbon dioxide, oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen, gas, hydrochloric acid, or methane, oxygen, gas, or water, as we have here, they are very, very small structures. They have covalent bonding. Their properties is that they have low melting points. and boiling points. They're generally going to be a gas at room temperature or a liquid at room temperature. They do not conduct electricity. For giant covalent compounds, ones made of carbon, such as graphite, diamond, or any fullerenes, or silicon dioxide, they're going to have a giant covalent structure. Their properties are high melting and boiling points, and they do not conduct, and they do not dissolve. Here we have diamond. It is a giant covalent compound, a giant covalent lattice. It is made of carbon, pure carbon, nothing else in there. And each carbon makes four bonds. So in the video you can see that the carbon is the black bits, the covalent bonds are the red bits, and each carbon is bonded to four other carbons. Obviously the ones on the edge aren't bonded to anything, but if you try and look in the middle you can see that they are bonded to four other things. The properties of diamond that make it really useful is that it's incredibly hard. It's very rare, it's hard to find, it's also very beautiful, which makes it very precious. But the main thing is that it's incredibly hard, so we can use it in drills. 
Graphite is also a giant covalent compound. It is like diamond, pure carbon, but each carbon makes three bonds to other carbons, not four like in diamond. The properties are that it is soft and it conducts electricity. Because it is in sheets and there is a spare electron floating around in between these, that means it will conduct electricity. Graphite is what you find in pencils, graphene is just a single sheet. If we were to compare diamond and uh, graphite, they are both made of pure carbon. They, um, graphite is made of three carbon-carbon bonds, diamond is made of four carbon-carbon bonds. Graphite is soft, diamond is hard. Fullerenes are either carbon nanotubules or Buckminster fullerenes, which are balls. These are again all made of pure carbon. They make three carbon-carbon bonds, but unlike graphite, which is soft, these are incredibly hard. Buckminster fullerene can be used as a lubricant in um, things that uh, need lubricating, like electrical cycles or some parts of machines. It can be used for reinforcement, so where you need a very, very strong, very, very light, um, things like aircrafts or bicycles. They can also both be used, or in the future be used, for drug delivery. And uh, fullerenes, carbon nanotubules, buckminster fullerenes, um, there are loads and loads of potentials for these, but they haven't been realised yet. With polymers, whether they have cross-links or not, are going to determine what their properties are going to be like. So polymers that do have cross-links are very, very fixed in place. These are going to burn upon heating, whereas polymers without cross-links are going to melt upon heating because these polymers can slide across each other, whereas these ones cannot slide across each other. Metals are made up of positive atoms in a sea of delocalized electrons. And these electrons being free to move is the reason that metal can conduct electricity. And why it's so good at conducting heat. An alloy looks slightly different to a metal. We still have our positive ions, we still have our delocalized electrons, but there's something else in there as well. This may be um, another metal it's alloyed with, or it may be something else like carbon that it's alloyed with. Pure metals have layers. Layers can slide across each other. Because they have layers and because they can slide across each other, they are soft. Alloys don't have layers or they have distorted layers. And the distorted layers cannot slide. And because the distorted layers cannot slide, it means they are hard. The new style of exams means there are a lot of wordy questions that incorporate a lot of skills all at once. In this question, you need to first of all recall the formula for things, then balance the equation. So hydrochloric acid is HCl, magnesium is Mg. Now we need to work out the products and the formula of the salts. A metal plus an acid is going to give us salts plus hydrogen. Hydrogen is the easy bit. It is H and then two because it goes around as a diatomic molecule. The salt is going to be magnesium chloride but we need to know that magnesium is a 2 plus ion and chlorine is a 1 minus ion so it needs to be MgCl2 so that there are two negative ions for each positive ion. Now this is brought in a lot of skills recall of the formulas and um, working out um, the salts um, the products so working out what type of equation it is and then after all of that we need to balance it. 
So to balance our equation, we draw a line down the middle, list what we have, hydrogen, chlorine, magnesium. Hydrogen, chlorine, magnesium is really going to help you if you keep things in the same order. Circle the compounds that we have. List are the numbers of things. So we have one hydrogen, one chlorine, one magnesium. Uh, two hydrogens, two chlorines, one magnesium. So you can see straight away we need some more hydrogens and some more chlorines. The easiest way for us to do that is to add another HCl on there. Then we're doing our numbers. We have two hydrogens and two chlorines. That is balanced. Writing it out neatly for the examiners because just leaving it like this won't get you the marks. We have two bubbles of hydrochloric acid plus magnesium turns into magnesium chloride plus hydrogen. You need to be able to take a set of words and turn it into a balanced symbol equation. So there is quite a lot for you to do here because you need to remember the chemical symbols for quite a large number of things. Water is H2O. That turns into hydrogen gas, which is going to be H2, plus oxygen gas, which is going to be O2. And now we need to balance it. Draw a line down the middle, circle everything, and list what we have. We have hydrogen, we have oxygen, we have hydrogen, we have oxygen. Count the number of things. Two hydrogens, one oxygen, two hydrogens, one ox two oxygen, sorry. So we need to increase the number of oxygens on this side because you see there aren't enough. Then we have to add another H2O, put that in a circle, redo our numbers. We now have two, four hydrogens and two oxygens. So our oxygens are balanced but now our hydrogens, are, we have more on this side than we do on this side. So we need to add more hydrogens here. Again, the only thing we can do is to add a whole another bubble. We now have two hydrogens here, two hydrogens here, making four in total and two oxygens. So now we have four hydrogens on this side, two oxygens, four hydrogens and two oxygens. We need to rewrite that neatly for the examiner. So we have one, two bubbles of H2O turning into one, two bubbles of H2 plus one of O2. When you are working out the MR, which is the relative formula mass, you need to take all of the ARs, which is the relative atomic masses, and add them together. Now the mass, remember, is the larger number of the two. Doesn't matter where it's located, it is the large number of the two. So hydrogen has a mass of 1 and we have 2 of them. Sulfur has a mass of 32. Oxygen has a mass of 16 and we have 4 oxygens. So 1 times 2 is 2 plus 32 plus 16 times 4 which is 64. Add those together we get 98. The empirical formula is the lowest ratio of all of the elements in a compound, and this is how we work it out. We have a compound that is 75% carbon and 25% hydrogen. So we're going to list carbon, hydrogen, write down the number in the question, and units do not matter for this. Not very often that I say that, I'm normally lagging you to learn your units, but whether it's percentage, whether it's tons, whether it's grams, units do not matter. Write down the mass from the periodic table, so carbon has a mass of 12, hydrogen has a mass of 1. You then need to divide the number in the question by the mass. So 75 divided by 12 is 6.25, 25 divided by 1 is 25. You then need to divide both of these by the smallest number. 625 is smaller than 25, so we need to divide both of these by 625. 6.25 divided by 6.25 gives us 1. 25 divided by 6.25 gives us 4, meaning there is 1 carbon to every 4 hydrogens, and that is the empirical formula. There is loads and loads of maths in this. Um, the majority of the content of this topic and a few other bits that come out elsewhere. 
you can get loads and loads of practice for this in my book, Maths, the Chemistry Bits. It has 60 equations for you to practice balancing, loads of titration calculations, loads of bond density calculations which come up later in the course. Lots and lots of things for you to do. A mole is not a rather cute blind black furry thing, but it is the unit for the amount of a substance and that is going to be 6 times 10 to the 23 atoms, ions or molecules and that is because that is the number of carbon atoms in 12 grams of carbon so our equation for this is going to be moles is equal to mass over MR. This is an incredibly complicated question which combines a lot of skills. First of all, we have to work out the formula of things, work out the equation, balance the equation, and then finally work out the amount of hydrogen, pro um, hydrogen peroxide. We have hydrogen peroxide decomposing into water. H2O and oxygen gas. Now we need to balance the equation. Hydrogen, oxygen, hydrogen, oxygen, two hydrogens, two oxygens, two hydrogens, three oxygens. So we can increase that by putting um, more oxygens over this side, H2O2, giving us four hydrogens four oxygens, now we need some more hydrogens and oxygens over the right hand side, pop another H2O on there, and we have four oxygens and four hydrogens. Giving us a final balanced equation of two hydrogen peroxides making two water and one oxygen. Now we need to know how much oxygen gas is given off from 40.8 grams of hydrogen peroxide. The first thing we do is to work out the masses involved in the equation. Hydrogen has a mass of 1 and there are 2 of them. Oxygen has a mass of 16 and there are 2 of them. That is 2 plus 32 giving us 34 and because there are 2 of them that gives us a total of 68. Hydrogen is 2, um, 1 times 2 equals 2, oxygen is 16. 2 plus 16 gives us 18, 18 times 2 gives us 36, and then oxygen is 16 times 2, giving us 32. So we can say that if we had 68 grams of hydrogen peroxide, it would decompose into 32 grams of oxygen. But we don't have 68 grams of hydrogen peroxide, we have... 40.8 grams of hydrogen peroxide and we need to find how much oxygen that decomposes to. This is now just a ratios question from maths. I'm going to put a 1 in there. To go from 68 to 1, we need to divide by 68. So that's what I need to do on the other side as well, divide by 68. Giving us 0.47. To go from 1 to 40.8, we need to times it by 40.8, which is exactly what we need to do over this side, times 40.8, but I don't want you to clear your calculator, I want you to keep the number in your calculator. So 0.47, or the long number in a calculator, times 40.8 gives 19.2 grams. If you had cleared your calculator and got um, just did 0.47, times 40.8 you have got an answer of 19.176 which is close but not the same answer what you've introduced is a rounding error when we are working out concentration that is going to be your amount divided by your volume concentration is measured in moles per decimeter cubed, amount is in moles and your volume is in decimeter cubed. When you have an equation there is always going to be a limiting reactant and your reaction is going to continue using up the limiting reaction forming product until you get to the point where your limiting reactant is used up.
And at that point, the reaction is going to stop. So whatever you don't want your limiting reactant to be, you always need to make sure the other one is in excess. Solids have a very, very fixed structure. That atoms may wiggle a little bit, but it is around a fixed point. There is going to be some movement and some vibration, but they are not flowing at all, and they can't be compressed. Liquids have much more movement around, but they are not in a fixed position. They can flow, but they can't be compressed. Gases are very, very free to move. There's lots of movement going on in here. It is not around a fixed position. They do a lot of moving. They can flow and they can be compressed. Going from a solid to a liquid is melting. From a liquid to a gas is evaporating. Going in this direction, we are putting energy in. Going in the other direction, energy is coming out. So from gas to a liquid, it is condensing. From a liquid to a solid, we are freezing. A compound has a melting point of 19 degrees, melting point and a boiling point of 74. Boiling point, what is the state at room temperature? Room temperature is about 25, 27. So, when it boils, it turns from a liquid into a gas. So above there, it is going to be a gas. And below there, it is going to be a liquid. Melting point, we are turning from a solid. So this way is going to be a solid, and above there is going to be a liquid. So at room temperature, it's going to be a liquid. Now, the other important thing to remember about boiling point and um, melting point is that the opposite is the same number. So boiling point is equal to condensing point. And melting point is equal to freezing point. We just talk about boiling point and melting point instead of condensing point and freezing point. They are exactly the same number. So if the boiling point is 74, the condensing point is 74. If the melting point is 19, the freezing point is 19. State symbols tell us what state something it's in. So an S is a solid. L is liquid. AQ is aqueous and G is gas. If you see state symbols in an equation, the answer generally refers to them. If you see something that's liquid and liquid or aqueous and aqueous going to a solid, it is going to turn cloudy. If you have a liquid and a solid or a liquid and liquid and a gas is produced, you are going to see bubbles or a loss of mass bubbles or fizzing. Elements, pure things, compounds, two or more different things chemically bonded together, mixture, lots of different things, some of them chemically bonded, some of them not. If you have a pure substance, it is going to melt at its melting point. If you have a mixture, it is going to melt over a range of melting points. We can test this by getting some crystals of the pure solution into a very, very thin tube. Putting it into a rather old-fashioned here melting point apparatus, you can see that the ends of the very, very thin tube have the crystals in, so we can see that happening. And then they go in the top of the melting point apparatus. And as the temperature rises, this is slowly heated up. We can have a look through the little glass window and see if the um, substance melts at one temperature or whether it melts slowly over a range of temperatures. We can use chromatography to separate out compounds and you're going to get probably what you did in class, these beautiful, beautiful um, separations by uh, Felphem. We need to make sure that the end of the paper is just in the water and that you've drawn your start line in pencil. If you draw it in pen, then your start line is going to run as well and that is going to cause you problems. We're going to put a lid on here to stop the solvent evaporating. When we want to work out RF value, we do the distance moved by the spot divided by the distance moved by the solvent. When you have mixtures and you want to separate them, there are a number of different things you can do. 
distillation where you're going to separate things off by boiling points, so things that have um, a different boiling point will distill at different temperatures. Evaporation where we are going to remove the liquid and leave solids that have been dissolved in the liquid in the dish. Filtration where we have large particles of solid in the liquid. The particles of solid will stay in the filter paper and the liquid will drip through. And fractional distillation where you can take things off at different boiling points. We would not survive very long without water. But only a small percent of the water on earth is suitable for us to drink. So we need to remove salt from it. Which is desalination. And we need to make it safe to drink. Or portable water. To make water safe to drink, we need to remove any um, dirt, mud in there, so any large solids. We need to remove the bacteria. And we need to remove any nasty or unwanted bits of um, too many mineral ions, like the salt that would be in seawater. We add in various different things to water. We add in chlorine to kill things and we add in fluoride for tooth protection and bone protection. On the pH scale, things that have a pH 1 are acidic, pH 7 is neutral and 14 is an alkaline. The ions responsible for acidity are hydrogen ions, the ions responsibility for alkalinity are hydroxide ions. The neutralisation equation is incredibly important, it comes up a lot and that tells us that hydrogen ions plus hydroxide ions can be neutralised to produce water. There are two indicators you can use for titrations, phenolphthalein which is the one you're seeing here, which in an alkali will be bright pink. And in an acid will be clear or colourless, or methyl orange, which in an alkali you can see it's going this yellowy colour. And in an acid will be bright red, giving us a neutralisation point where it is an orange colour. There is a big difference between strength and concentration. Strong acids are going to fully dissociate into hydrogen ions and other ions. The strong acids are hydrochloric acid, nitric acid, sulfuric acid, hydrobromic acid, hydroiodic acid and chloric acid. I would expect you to know that hydrochloric acid is HCl, nitric acid is HNO. Three, and sulfuric acid is H2SO4. The other ones we don't have to worry about too much. Everything else is a weak acid, which means only partially dissociates. Here we have strong and weak acids at high and low concentrations. So for our strong acid, we can see our hydroxide ions and our hydrogen ions are fully dissociated. They're not touching each other. They are separated. Here we have them at a high concentration, which means there are lots of hydroxide and hydrogen ions compared to very few water molecules. Here we have our strong acid, again fully dissociated, but at a low concentration, meaning there aren't very many um, hydrogen or hydroxide ions in a lot of water. For our weak acids, they are only partially dissociated, so some of the hydrogen and hydroxide ions have separated and some of them haven't meaning that we are going to get some which are still together and some which are separated. At a high concentration, there are going to be lots of acid particles for a very few particles of water, whereas at a low concentration, there aren't going to be very many um, acid molecules per molecule of water. You need to remember all of the equations, remember the ions, and be able to work out what is going to come from a reaction. So if we have an acid and a metal, we are going to get a salt plus hydrogen. Acid and metal oxide is going to give us a salt plus 
water, acid metal hydroxide is going to be a salt plus water, acid metal base, salt plus water, acid plus metal carbonate is going to give us a salt, water and carbon dioxide. To work out the formula of the salts, you need to know the formula of all of your ions. Um, I've made flashcards to help you with this. Um, you can watch the video. I'm afraid you're going to need to watch it over and over again so that you learn it. And then you're going to need to make sure that you combine the ions in such a way that they are neutral overall. In an experiment, when you see bubbles coming off something, chances are it's going to be one of these four types of gases. Hydrogen gas, oxygen gas, carbon dioxide or chlorine gas. To test for hydrogen gas, it is a squeaky pop. To test for oxygen gas, it is going to relight a glowing splint. Carbon dioxide turns lime water cloudy and chlorine gas is going to bleach damp litmus paper. For making a pure salt we are going to be making sulf uh, copper sulfate. This is mixing sulfuric acid and copper oxide to make copper sulfate and water. You're going to need to heat the sulfuric acid, stir it in the copper oxide, which is a black powder, until it is in excess, which basically means you can't dissolve it anymore. Let it cool a bit, and then you can filter the solution to remove the excess copper oxide, so that the black copper oxide powder will stay in the filter paper, and then the solution of copper sulfate will come out down the bottom. Once you have your solution of copper sulfate, you can evaporate away the water to leave you with the copper sulfate crystals. Now this, the size of the crystals, will depend on how quickly you do this. You're going to be left with blue crystals. The blue crystals here are the hydrated ones and the white crystals around the edge are the anhydrous ones. To carry out titration, first of all you need to put 25 centimeters cubed in an alkali into a conical flask. Add a phenolphthalein indicator or an indicator like methyl orange. Fill a burette with an acid of a known concentration. Take the initial reading on the burette and record it. And while swirling the flask, use the tap to slowly add drop by drop the acid into the alkali. When the first permanent colour change happens, pink to clear for phenolphthalein, stop adding the acid. Record the final volume in the burette and repeat titers until you get it within 0 0.05 centimetres cubed. Bit of a mental break here for you guys, just a tiny pause, you are doing so, so well. Let's keep going, we are nearly there. When we are working out solubility rules, what is soluble, what is not soluble, it is really going to help if you know the formula of the ions and your salt equations. All nitrates are soluble. Most sulfates are soluble apart from lead sulfate, barium sulfate and calcium sulfate. Most halogen compounds, so most chlorides, bromides and iodides are soluble except when they're combined with silver or lead. So for example, silver chloride, silver bromide, silver iodide are insoluble, lead chloride, lead bromide and lead iodide are insoluble. Sodium carbonate, potassium carbonate and ammonium carbonate are soluble. All other carbonates are insoluble. Sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide and ammonium hydroxide are soluble. All other hydroxides are insoluble. Here we have sodium chloride. Now ionic compounds have to be molten or dissolved to be able to conduct electricity. Because it's when it's in its solid state, you can see that this sodium and these chlorines are not going anywhere. They're very, very fixed. However, in a liquid or a molten or a dissolved state, when these ions are free to move around, that is when they're going to be conducting electricity and that's when you can do electrolysis. The common setups for electrolysis that you need to know are sodium chloride, sodium sulfate, copper chloride and copper sulfate. For sodium chloride the products you are going to get 
are hydrogen gas, chlorine gas and sodium hydroxide. For copper sodium sulfate, the products you're going to get are going to be hydrogen and oxygen gas. For copper chloride, you are going to get copper and chlorine gas. And for copper sulfate, you are going to get copper and oxygen gas. When we set up electrolysis, you need positive and negative electrode. Light bulb there just to check that electricity is flowing. You can see bubbles collecting around the positive and negative electrode. Sometimes this might be a metal collecting, as in the case of copper collecting here and here in copper sulfate and copper chloride. Um, you can test for all of the different gases coming off, for example, hydrogen, chlorine and oxygen. The test for hydrogen gas is a squeaky pop. The test for oxygen gas is relighting, glowing splint. And the test for chlorine gas is that it bleaches, damp, litmus paper. When you have a redox reaction, oxidation is loss of electrons, reduction is gain of electrons. A good way to remember what the electrodes are called is that the positive electrode is the anode and negative is cathode. At each electrode in electrolysis, we're going to have oxidation and reduction taking place and movement of electrons. And the half equations need to reflect this and they need to be balanced. The first thing we need to balance is the elements. In the first one, we have um, copper and copper, one on each side, that's fine. But here we have a two plus charge, we need to make a neutral charge. The only thing we can add in is electrons, which have a negative charge. Because copper is two plus, we need to add in two electrons. We are adding in electrons, this is gain of electrons, so this is reduction. And because copper is positive, it will go to the negative electrode. which is the cathode. Second one is a bit more complicated because you can see fluorine ion will go to a diatomic fluorine molecule. First thing we need to do is to balance the fluorines to go in there. Now we need to balance atoms. We have two negative and it needs to go to a neutral. So we need to lose something. The only thing we can lose are electrons and to balance out the charges, we need to lose two electrons. This is loss of electrons, so it is oxidation. Fluorine is negative, so it will go to the positive electrode. And the positive electrode is the anode. We can list the metals by how reactive they are, with the most reactive being at the top, and the least reactive being at the bottom. Now you need to remember these, if you have any good mnemonics remembering these, um, you can pop those in the description below, in the comments below, that would really, really help other people. Things that are above carbon need electrolysis to be extracted, whereas things that are below carbon can just be extracted by reduction. However, things that are really, really unreactive, like silver, gold and copper, are generally found in the earth as their pure ores, unreacted with anything. Everything else is generally going to be reacted with oxygen in the form of metal oxides. You can also use this to predict the products from electrolysis. If the metal you are um, uh, used in the electrolysis is more reactive than hydrogen, then you're going to get hydrogen as a gas. If it is less reactive, then you're going to get something yeah. else as a gas. And we can use this to predict the products for displacement reactions. 
if we reacted magnesium chloride with calcium, because calcium is more reactive than the magnesium, the calcium is going to take the place. So we are going to get calcium chloride plus magnesium as our products. However, if we reacted magnesium chloride with aluminium, because magnesium is more reactive, aluminium cannot take the place, it will not displace it, so no reaction is going to take place. There are lots of very important metals on Earth and some of them are very, very rare. So we need to develop new ways to get rare metals out through low yield ores. Low yield is where using traditional mining methods wouldn't be financially viable. Two of these methods are bioleaching and phytomining. Bioleaching is when we have a large body of water, say a lake, which has metal in it, such as copper dissolved in it. If we want to get the copper out of the lake, out of the water, we can add in bacteria. These will take up the um, copper from the water and then they will leach out copper ions. It's basically the bacteria's way. Another method is if we have lots of copper again in the soil but at very, very low yield. So not enough for us to dig up the soil and get the copper out, say, by reduction or electrolysis. We can put plants in. This is generally, believe it or not, broccoli. The plants will then absorb the copper ions from the soil. We can then cut them down and burn them. And then from the ash, we can do electrolysis. The disadvantage of using phytomining is that plants grow very slowly. Aluminium electrolysis is a slightly different form of electrolysis. We have one electrode up here, this is our positive anode, and another electrode down here, this is our negative cathode. The molten aluminium and the cryolite. Cryolite is just um, a compound that is added to reduce the melting point of molten aluminium oxide. It's added into this reaction vessel and we get one reaction taking place down here and another reaction taking place at the top. At the bottom, at the negative cathode, we are going to be attracting the positive aluminium ions. They are going to be picking up electrons and turning into aluminium atoms. This is three plus, so it needs to pick up three electrons. And then at the top, at the carbon electrode, we are going to attract the negative oxygens. They are going to be losing electrons and turning into oxygen gas. Because we have two on this side, two oxygens on that side, we need two on that side. Which means we now have four negative charges, we need to lose four electrons as well. This is a carbon electrode up here and we are causing a starting reaction which causes oxygen gas to be evolved. Eventually the oxygen gas will react with the carbon electrode and we are going to lose the electrode as carbon dioxide. So the carbon dioxide will wear away the electrode eventually, so this will need to be replaced. The molten aluminium collects at the bottom and can be taken off like that, and that is how we purify aluminium. The earth provides us with many things, including warmth from the sun, shelter from the trees, food from plants and animals, transport along rivers and we can get all of these from the rivers, the seas, the atmosphere and the land. When you're doing a life cycle assessment of an object, you need to look at the different stages of its life, the manufacture, the use and the disposal, and the environmental impacts of each of these sections. So the environmental impacts of the energy, so the energy needed for production of this, bearing in mind that this generally comes from um, fossil fuels which have been burnt, so electricity based on fossil fuels, leading to carbon dioxide being put into the atmosphere. The materials used, 
whether they can be used from um, natural resources or whether it, something else can be used, whether natural resources have to be further processed, the production of the product, using the product and disposal of the products. Using the product, does it need electricity to use it? Does anything come out of it when it's being used? Production of the product, we're talking about things like atom economy, how much of the um, reactants are actually going to end up in the product, how much waste is there, how much waste of the natural resources that went into it um, when you're making the product. And disposal of the product, can be it be recycled, can um, it be incinerated for another use or is it just going to have to go to landfill? This half arrow on top of the other half arrow going in the opposite direction is a symbol for a reversible reaction. Ammonium chloride will decompose into ammonia and hydrogen chloride gas upon heating and this is an endothermic reaction because you need to put heat into it. Cooling it is an exothermic reaction because energy will come out. Hydrated copper sulfate, which is a lovely blue colour, upon heating will lose the water, turn into anhydrous copper sulfate, which is a white colour. Adding water in will turn it back to hydrated copper sulfate. Lechitelier's principle tells us that whatever you do to a reversible reaction, the reaction will do the opposite. So in this reaction, this way is endothermic and this way is exothermic. So if you heat up a reaction, the endothermic reaction will increase to compensate and the exothermic reaction will decrease to compensate. Whereas if you decrease the temperature, then the endothermic reaction will decrease to compensate and the exothermic reaction will increase to compensate so that the overall temperature stays the same. If you're going to change the temperature of the concentration, the reaction will also adjust itself to compensate. If you are going to increase the pressure or the concentration, then the reaction will shift to the side that has less moles to compensate. If you're going to decrease, then it will shift to the side that has more moles to compensate. The Harbour process produces ammonia from nitrogen and hydrogen gas. Our main source of nitrogen and hydrogen gas is getting them from the air. We can also get hydrogen gas from the electrolysis of water. They are fed into the reaction vessel where they will be turned into ammonia, which is a liquid, so that can be taken off at the bottom. And any unreacted gases can go back round into the reaction. It is done at 450 degrees C at 200 atmospheres and using an iron catalyst. The production of ammonia is very important because it is an important source of nitrogen for fertilisers. The conditions used in the harbour process are actually a compromise. The forward reaction is exothermic, so this tells us, using Le Chatelier's principle of dynamic equilibrium, that we should be using a low temperature if we want to drive the forward reaction, but at a low temperature we have a low rate of reaction. So even though using the high temperature of 450 degrees drives the backwards reaction away from ammonia towards the production of the gas, the rate of reaction is so fast that it is constantly cycling between the two. So 450 degrees is a compromised temperature. The ammonia comes off as a liquid, so that can be taken off, that can be removed, which is also going to drive the forward reaction. There are less moles of product than there are moles of reactant. There are four over this side and two over this side. So high pressures of 200 atmospheres are going to drive the forward reaction because this is going to take up less space. There are less moles of it. A higher pressure would increase the rate of the forward reaction even more, but it would be dangerous because high pressure leads to risk of explosion. So 200 atmospheres is used because it is a relatively safe pressure to do it with. As we increase the pressure, the danger to the workers increases. The um, thickness of the walls increases. And also stuff like insurance costs are going to increase. The rest of this video is for separate chemistry students only. So if you have finished, well done. Excellent work. It was a bit of a slog this video. Um, you can go and move on to the next video. Use your revision guide. Uh, if you've got separate chemistry, I'm afraid you've got a bit more to go. Transition metals are in the middle. Their properties are that they 
are hard, shiny and are good conductors. These are basically your traditional metals, so any property of traditional metal, you can generally associate it with a transition metal. Um, because of their properties, they can be used in jewellery, in wires, or in saucepans. Um, and because they get all these different colours, they can be used for things like stained glass or for coating statues. Here the Statue of Liberty has a copper coating. Copper, uh, transition metal compounds are generally going to be blue or a bluey green. Iron 2 is light green. Iron 3 is an orangey brown, a rust colour. And cobalt is a really lovely deep rich blue. For rusting to take place, we need to have iron, oxygen, and water, and that is going to result in iron oxide. You can see in my experiment here that the iron oxide is this brown, orangey red stuff that is on the sides. Rusting will actually lead to an increase in mass because you're taking the iron and you're adding in the oxygen. There are a couple of ways we can stop this from happening. We can um, galvanise things. We can coat things. We can use a sacrificial metal. For titration calculations, we first need to calculate the number of moles of acid used. We can use this to find the number of hydrogen ions involved in the reaction. This is going to be equal to the number of hydroxide ions at the point of neutralisation. We can use this to calculate the number of moles of alkali used and concentrate the calculation of the acid. We have 25 centimetres cubed of alkali, was neutralised by 15 centimetres cubed of 0.2 moles acid. Find the concentration of the alkali. First thing I'm going to do is pull all the information out of the question. Concentration of the alkali is what we're trying to find. Volume of the alkali, 25 centimetres cubed. Concentration of the acid, 0.2 moles per decimeter cubed. Volume of the acid, 15 centimetres cubed. So the first thing you do is calculate the number of moles of acid used. So for the number of moles of acid used, we're going to use concentration of the acid times volume of the acid. That is 0.2 times the volume of the acid, which is 15, divided by 1,000, because we need it in decimeters cubed. So 0.2 times 0.015 giving us an answer of 0.003 moles. If we look at our balanced equation, we can see that acid and alkali are in a one-to-one -one ratio in this equation. So there's going to be an equal number of hydrogen and hydroxide ions. So we know that our moles of um, acid are 0.003 moles, which means our moles of alkali must also be 0.003 moles. Now we know the number of moles of alkali, we can use concentration by volume again, rearranging that because we know the moles and we know the volume to find the concentration. We can use moles equals concentration times volume again and rearranging that because we know our moles and we know our volume. So moles divided by volume will give us concentration. So our moles from we've just worked out is 0 0.003. Our concentration is 25 centimetres cubed. Divided that by 1,000 to get it in decimetres cubed. So that is going to be 0 0.003 divided by 0 0.025, giving us 0 0.12 moles per decimetre cubed as our concentration of alkali. To work out percentage yield, you need to take your actual yields and divide it by your theoretical yields. So if this 
is your actual yield, then your theoretical yield is how much you thought you were going to make. To work out your atom economy, that is your MR of atoms in the required products over your MR of reactants. Or the MR of stuff you wanted. Over the MR of the stuff you actually got. When you are dealing with gases, what you need to remember is that one mole is always going to take up 24 decimeters cubed. Ammonium sulfate can be made from the reaction of ammonia and sulfuric acid or ammonium hydroxide and sulfuric acid. Fertilizers are good because they increase crop production, but they also lead to an increase in eutrophication. Here we have a simple cell with two different metals, copper and zinc, in their own solution. So here is zinc in zinc sulfate solution and copper in copper sulfate solution. They are connected by a salt bridge or an iron bridge and because zinc is high in the electrochemical series it is going to push electrons this way towards copper. A flow of electrons means we are going to have a potential difference. So the zinc is going to be giving up electrons and the copper is going to be accepting electrons. That thing that we commonly refer to as a battery is actually a cell. I know, I know, it's really annoying. A cell is one battery. A battery is more than one cell. So this is a cell. And then two or more of them together would be a battery. In non-rechargeable batteries, the chemical reaction that produces electricity, once that is used up, the battery is dead. Whereas in a rechargeable battery, there is a reversible reaction that goes on. So once the reactants are used up, you can pass electricity through it, which will cause the reaction to go in the opposite direction, recharging the battery. In a hydrogen fuel cell, we just have hydrogen gas reacting with oxygen gas and turning into water. There is a large amount of energy released. Which can be used to power an electric car. And water is the only product. Which means there are no carbon emissions. There are a few problems with this, uh, predominantly with the production of hydrogen. At the moment this uses fossil fuels because hydrogen can either be made more acting steam with coal or natural gas, which are both fossil fuels. Or hydrogen is made by electrolysis of water, but that involves electricity, electricity which is generated using fossil fuels. The other problems are it's quite hard to find. The hydrogen needs to be compressed. Which is a problem because it will be explosive. It also needs a very, very large tank to store it in. And they don't work at low temperatures. At the negative electrode, we are going to have hydrogen gas minus two electrons turning into hydrogen ions. At the positive electrode, we are going to have these hydrogen ions reacting with the oxygen gas and some electrons, and they are then going to turn into the water. Well done for making it to the end of this video, you are all absolute superstars. 
all the best in your exams. I'm keeping all of my fingers crossed for you.